Aging is not for the faint of heart. Over 50% of people will have a brain degeneration with age. This is when you consider Alzheimer's and other dementia, Parkinson's, senile gait, and stroke. The aging brain can be modeled by looking at the lessons from Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, because they all have similar characteristics. There's a leaky gut, there's dysbiosis in the gut with decreased species that produce some chemicals that we need, like butyrate. And there's also a leaky blood-brain barrier. And the proteinopathy that we think about with, let's say, Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease starts in the gut. So 10 years, 10 years before someone has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, there are often changes that relate to the gut. So abnormal weight loss and constipation happens many years before they become demented. <clears throat> Let's look into this process of aging a little bit more. There is a central clock that determines how old you are and when you die. That central clock is in relation to the hypothalamus that you see here and the pineal gland. The hypothalamus is lined with stem cells that produce exosomes. And these exosomes go into the hypothalamus to maintain a youthful phenotype, and they also get produced and released into the spinal fluid, and it bathes the entire brain in keeping them intact. As the blood is pulsing, the choroid plexus basically makes the spinal fluid mix and pulsate. So materials are released between the pineal gland and the hypothalamus and back and forth, and also exosomes are delivered into the brainstem. This is absolutely critical for understanding the, the gut-brain connection. If you don't believe about this central clock of aging, let's look at this amazing experiment that was done by one of my collaborators at Albert Einstein Medical School, this is Dr. Kai and his group. He did this remarkable experiment about aging. If you take a pipette and you put it adjacent to this biological clock mechanism in the hypothalamus, and you create an immunological lesion, so you kill just the stem cells that line the third ventricle, this is what happens to a rodent it becomes old almost instantaneously. Their hair falls out, they become sexually inactive, their muscles are weak, their bones are fragile, and cognitively, they become impaired almost overnight. Now that's sort of an interesting experiment, but this I find even more relevant for today's discussion. If you take that same model and you give exosomes from a young mouse, you make that mouse who is afflicted with potential aging, you make them young again. Their hair grows in, their muscles get strong again, and they become cognitively intact. So the aging is all dependent on this central clock that can be manipulated. And if this can be manipulated in mice, Maybe it can be manipulated in humans. So it's the relationship between the pineal gland and the hypothalamus that's relevant. If you, if you take out the pineal gland, these little 
black spots, which are the stem cells in the hypothalamus coming off the third ventricle, if you take away the pineal gland, those cells die. That's exactly what happens to all of us. As we age, the pineal gland is making less and less of a signal that's required for the hypothalamus to remain young. And that signal is melatonin and perhaps other things like epithalamin. If you chart melatonin concentrations over the course of decades, it falls down. And when you get to be like my age, there's almost no melatonin left. And that's because the pineal gland calcifies with age. So here's a relatively normal older person with just a little bit of calcium in the pineal gland. When it gets completely calcified, there's no more melatonin being produced. And you can see this whole brain is deteriorating. This is someone who has Alzheimer's disease. The deterioration of the pineal gland also prevents the immune system from remaining functional. So you know that the pineal gland is responsible for melatonin and also keeps the, thalam the thymus young. So as the thymus involutes, you get immunosenescence. And that produces a dysbiosis. Some of these chronic infections become much more important and they start to wear down your body. Now, why is it happening according to this model? Well, I, just, I was just showing you that these exosomes are needed to keep the brain integrity intact. In fact, the first thing that degenerates 10 or 20 years before you get Alzheimer's disease, in fact, this is happening by the time you're 30, which is just about everybody in this room. There's already a protein deposit of tau in your brain stem causing an existential free fall. You don't know it yet, but you'll know it in some number of years. And as the brain stem is affected, so is the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve controls many things in your body. As you know, it connects the entire gut and into the gut lining. The vagus nerve is very important for gut integrity. The vagus nerve actually prevents the monocytes embedded in the gut wall from producing inflammatory substances. So there is a cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway that is mediated by the vagal nerve. So as the vagal nerve degenerates, you start getting a breakdown in the gut and a breakdown in the uh, immunological components in the gut. Plus, the loss of motility is another problem that can change the biome. So there are dendritic cells that actually taste what's in our gut. I don't know if this is particularly appetizing when we're having lunch, but there are dendritic cells that send little tongues into your gut to taste your poop and to see what's actually in there and to react to it. It turns out that with mild cognitive impairment, so these are the people that come to you and you say, hey doc, my memory's not as good as it used to be. So what is growing in their gut? They have too much E. coli. So if you look at E. coli, mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease, not much different. In fact, when people come to you with mild cognitive impairment, they're already on an Alzheimer's pathway because those pathobiomes that are in your gut are already there doing their damage. And the same thing with Parkinson's disease. Now, if you look at occludin, which is a measure of the tight junctions in your gut, there is a increased serum concentration as it's released and picked up by the bloodstream, you can detect this by looking at the amount of occludin in the bloodstream with mild cognitive impairment as well as with a more severe cognitive change. There's also an increase, gradual increase, in LPS. These are the breakdown products of gram-negative bacteria wall. 
So those E. coli that we're talking about, they break down, they die, they give off toxins, which are absorbed into your system. So why is this happening? It turns out that there may not be that much difference in how much of this LPS toxin is created in the gut between normal people and people with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. But one thing that is very important is the type of bacteria that are producing butyrate. So butyrate is a chemical that seals up the leaky gut that's created by the so-called good bacteria. It also turns out that amyloid production starts in the gut. And it seems to be the beginning of Alzheimer's disease. So think of Alzheimer's disease as a gut to brain inflammatory process. Now you might ask yourself, how about some of these conditions that we know have leaky guts, like, like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease? Well, if you look at them, they have a much earlier onset of dementia than the average person. So a leaky gut by itself is a risk factor. The blood brain barrier also starts to break down. So not only is there a leaking of toxins into the body, but they get through the second barrier at the brain level. The blood brain barrier is broken down by some of these inflammatory substances as well. So LPS, the lipopolysaccharides, ginger pains which come out of your gums, and porphyromonas gingivalis that grows between your gums and your teeth, tumor necrosis factor, they leak into the brain and they cause havoc. You can test for the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier with serological tests as well now. These boogers are in your brain right now. There are actually these parasitic brain agents, microglia, that are moving around your brain to find pathogens and toxins. And unfortunately, when they get angry, they kill the innocent bystanders that neurological network that we require for who you are, your personality, and your company. So how can we measure how much leakiness there is in your gut? and in your brain. Because it's this infusion, this permeation of toxin that gets from your blood, to your brainstem, to your brain, to those microglia, those angry boogers that you just saw, that eat up your brain, that are responsible for neurodegeneration. So how do we test for this? And how do we stop it? So, this is a picture out of the KBMO website, which you can all go and read more about this. Um, but there is zonulin, which is a signaling molecule to open up the blood-brain barrier. Now, if you try to measure zonulin, it's very tricky because it's very immunogenic. And if you take a normal person and you try to measure zonulin, it's bouncing all over the place. So when you go from one trial to the next trial to the next trial, you're getting a variability in signal when you don't know what to make of it. So KBMO came up with a brilliant solution. Don't check the zonulin. Check the zonulin antibody. So the idea here is, if you have zonulin bouncing up and down, you're eventually going to build antibodies, which are very stable. They're stable for a month at a time. So it's sort of like getting hemoglobin A1C to check for your blood sugar, right? You sort of get an integrated response. So you can do that by getting an antibody to zonulin. And that's what KBM and KBMO is doing. I highly suggest 
that everybody in this room reads this paper. This is not done by KBMO. This, this is the original research that was been, that's been published in, in the GI journal. It goes over how zonulin antibody performs compared to zonulin. The sensitivity, specificity, it's a brilliant article. Please read it, you'll understand it. And this is kind of a complicated slide from that paper, but I'm just gonna show a few things. If you look at zonulin levels, control versus people with celiac disease, who you know have a leaky gut, there's, there's not really much separation between those groups. So measuring zonulin is not particularly sensitive. On the other hand, there is great separation between see it that if you look at the second column you can look at the difference between uh, celiac disease and a control group there's a huge set of separation when you look at zonulin antibody so it's also there's not much overlap either so it's specific and it's sensitive and it's stable it's reliable from trial to trial so what you really want to be measuring is zonulin antibody Occludin is, is one of the proteins that makes up the tight junctions itself, so you can also measure how much the tight junctions have been opened up by looking at occludin. And here's what the test looks like. Clean the tip of your finger with the alcohol pad. We recommend the middle or pointer finger of your non-dominant hand. Save the alcohol pad for later. Open the lancet and place it on either side of your fingertip. <coughs> Press the lancet firmly against the tip until it clicks. Now wipe away the first droplet with the alcohol pad to prevent it from clotting too quickly. Gently massage the finger to produce a large droplet of blood. This part is the most important. Do not touch your finger to the paper. Instead, let the droplet become large enough to drop on its own. This will ensure it only takes one droplet per circle. Repeat this for all five circles, continuing to massage the finger to help produce the droplets. When all five circles are filled, provide pressure to the puncture site with a gauze or a paper towel, and then bandage the finger. Allow the card to dry for 20 minutes. All bleeding eventually stops. Close the blood spot collection card and place it in the biohazard bag. Put this and the patient requisition form in the provided mailer. It will either have a stamp or a provided shipping label. And finally, once the mail is received by our lab, it will take about two weeks to get your results, but the wait will be worth it. And this is the part I really like. This is like opening a Christmas present for me. So I have my patient, I want to know what's happening with their gut, I want to know if they're leaking their gut, if there's anything I need to do to intervene. And you get this sort of a report back that tells you how much antibody there is for candida, which it may have been uh, for a lot of interest for people in the audience, but for zonulin, occludin, and LPS. So you can see if those toxins are leaking in, you can see if the, if the junction proteins are being picked up, and you can see if zonulin is present. And by the way, if zonulin is positive, it not only means that the gut is leaking, but zonulin is also responsible for controlling the brain, the blood-brain barrier. So if you see elevated zonulin, you can bet that there's a leaky gut and a leaky brain. And as you know, when the gut is leaky, food particles get in that don't normally get into your bloodstream. So you start making antibodies to a whole host of things that you didn't have antibodies before. So you look at all the food sensitivities that people have built up over the years because of a leaky gut, and you can act on this. So in this case, the person who perhaps has celiac disease um, has um, 
antibodies to, to weak uh, components. And you get a whole list of food just for those blood, those blood sticks. Very, very nice. So what do you do if you have a leaky gut and a leaky brain? We have to act on it. So what are the possibilities? So uh, there isn't a lot of human clinical trial data using butyrate, but there's some excellent preclinical studies that have looked at using butyrate to reduce gut leakiness in rodents. And some histology, which is quite striking. So we can also think about probiotics. Let's use some good bacteria. Now, what makes them good? They suppress pathobionts. They influence the production of neurotransmitters. 80% of the neurotransmitters that your brain need are made in cooperation with your gut and the good bacteria that live in the gut. Is that cool or what? It also produces molecules that maintain barrier function. So there have been a number of human studies looking at probiotics. These typically involve mixtures of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. There are several uh, randomized studies looking at this in terms of uh, the effect on dementia as well. So we have something that actually has some research behind it. Uh, zinc carnosine is another very interesting study, and there's a human trial that was quite interesting, where they took some uh, human volunteers and gave them a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agent on purpose to cause a leaky gut. And they gave them zinc carnosine, and they were able to show that uh, in the active group, they could keep the leakiness of the gut down. This is using a lactulose to rhamnose very conventional, old-school way of checking for gut leakiness, this LR ratio. But this is what it looks like with placebo. So you can change gut leakiness by carnosine, by butyrate, and by probiotics. Now, here's another molecule which is very interesting, and perhaps many of you are using this. Now, unfortunately, in my neck of the woods, California, um, I can't get this because peptides aren't allowed in the state of California, but in my clinic in Florida, we can do this, and offshore we can do this, but lorazotide is an interesting uh, eight amino acid peptide, which has been shown in a meta-analysis to be effective in reducing gut leakiness. Interesting, lubriprostone which we probably use for constipation in some of our patients, also has been shown to reduce gut leakiness in humans. So that may be something you may want to use anyway for someone who has constipation. So that's kind of, you get a twofer there. So here's my summary of a basic approach to a leaky gut. Get the KBO fit test. I get this on all of my patients. Get a fecal uh, biome as a baseline. Uh, watch for food sensitivities. Avoid drugs that worsen leaks, for example, NSAIDs. Uh, consider the diet, prebiotics, probiotics, butyrate. Um, and here are the dosages that you use for butyrate. It's 1.2 grams BID. Um, it comes as a sodium salt and as a calcium magnesium salt. I like to use the calcium magnesium salt because the amount of sodium, when you're looking at a couple of grams a day, is a lot. Uh, so I like to use the calcium magnesium, and plus you, you may want to use magnesium anyway for other reasons. So it's like a good thing to do. It's sort of like, again, it's another twofer there. Um, and zinc carnosine. Then you also get the zinc that you want for um, helping your gut health. Um, now. BPC, there's not a lot of uh, clinical data in randomized trials, but lorazotide actually has a meta-analysis out there, so that's something to consider. Now, I'm, I'm quickly gonna go through a few other things, things coming through the nose. There were children getting Alzheimer's disease in Mexico City just from this pollution that they were breathing. Seven-year-olds getting Alzheimer's disease in histology when they were, when they were dead from 
having suicides caused by their rapid brain deterioration just from breathing. We have to look at some of the conventional viruses. So I test um, for the, the herpes viruses that can come in through your nose and mouth, through the trigeminal system and through your veins. We've got to look at the teeth, gingivalis, um, a porphyrmonis gingivalis is one of the major factors for Alzheimer's disease. And it, it grows on these bad gums. So when you see advanced periodontitis, you can bet that they have porphyrmonis in there. Get, get these people to get deep cleaning very frequently. Get in the habit of looking at people's dentition. It's one of the most important things you can do. And there's a difference if you, if you if you look at people with chronic periodontitis, there's a much higher incidence of Alzheimer's disease. It doubles the risk. It's huge. So good fat and bad fat. Sorry, it's lunchtime, I guess. Um, so, so bad fat, when you when you're, have too much fat on your body, it's inflammatory. So measure it. Um, think about the good fats, like the plasmodium precursors, so we know about trying to lower cholesterol, but we also want to get the omega-3 fatty acids. One of the best ways of getting that in is using the plasmodium precursors. Um, just remember that the plasmologins are absolutely required for good brain function. You stop making it when you get beyond 30, when you're in that existential free fall. Beyond age 30, you don't make enough of these components that your brain needs. Supplement it. Here are some of the studies that we did in combination with Duke and the University of Pennsylvania. So this is the last thing I wanted to show you. You think you're in control. I don't think so. It's your guts in control. These bacteria exude all kinds of substances that work on your hypothalamus, remember? that clock that determines how old you are and when you're gonna die, the bacteria make things that act on your hypothalamus. So they get you to become carbohydrate craving because certain bacteria want carbohydrates. So they send out molecules that control you. You're a zombie. It's the gut that's controlling you, not the other way around. Just, a, before we end, just a few pet peeves that I have. So Mediterranean diet, meat versus fish, this is an argument. I think meat is fine if you don't have soy and corn finishing, and you don't have antibiotics, and you don't have hormones, right? So it should be pasture-raised and pasture-finished. This kills me. I go to the supermarket, I won't mention names of supermarkets, and the label says, pasture raised, grass fed. But they don't tell you the last three months of their life, they were penned up given antibiotics, hormones, and fattened up with corn and soy, right? So you have to know your source. Milk and dairy. Dairy is a living material. If you use high heat pasteurization, which is the most way, that we get milk, it kills it. Low heat pasteurization, the exosomes, the young exosomes, which have the same signaling characteristics that young exosomes have, you can get that from milk, but it has to be low heat pasteurization. I love this thing about organic food. One of my good friends who's a farmer said, organic farmers are the ones that spray at night. <laughs> There is something called organic pesticides. If it's natural, it's a pesticide, you can use it. If it kills the pests on the food that you're eating, what do you think it does to the good bacteria in your gut? Well, it goes to the reason that not all foods and supplements contain what you think. Yet, unfortunately, unless you're growing it yourself, you don't know. Food preparation is, is, is absolutely critical, and this is probably the last thing I'm going to say. High heat cooking produces 
advanced glycation end products. They're absorbed and they turn all your soft tissues in your body to leather. So those blood vessels that you'd like to be supple, you turn them into leather. Barbecue, broiling, frying. The food, perfectly good food, is going to be destroyed if you do that. Soft boil, steam, poaching, slow cooker. That slow cooker you got as a wedding gift that's in your closet, take it out of the box and use it. Fecal transplantation, this is obviously research here in the United States, but this is something that hopefully we'll have more access to. So let me so a syn thank, thank you. So a synopsis. So a central clock maintains brain and body function through the immune system. And two systems modulate inflammation, the adrenal system and the vagal system, top-down control, including the health of your gut. Aging of the immune system and autonomic nervous system decay promotes a leaky gut and dysbiosis. Dysbiosis, leaky gut, permeable blood-brain barrier inflammation are key elements to all of these aging-related neurodegenerations. The, KBO, the KBMO FIT-176 test may be used to evaluate a leaky gut and food sensitivities at the same time with a few drops of blood. The leaky gut may be approached with diet, probiotics, prebiotics, carnosine, and butyrate. Refluorization and fecal transplant is an emergent option, not really available just yet. <coughs> Oral dysbiosis due to periodontitis is a le likely major additional contributor to Alzheimer's disease and requires good dental health approaches. For more information, here's a little plug. I happen to know the authors. Forever and to the ending, single cell organisms conspire but perhaps not today. So you're talking about younger individuals? Sorry. Yes, well, like even just older ones, if you have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, they're leaky by definition, right? Well, I, I think the question is, we were talking about older individuals, would this apply to younger people during their development? Is that, is that what you're asking? Well, just the, the fact that the variety of And that's how I got involved in all this. I was actually a smart in college. 
We should be proactive. That's why we're here. That's why we're doing A4M, right? A4M is not about treating disease. It's about optimizing health. So if we can identify a problem and we can act on it at an early stage, I think that's what we all want to do. So it's easy. We can check the gut leakiness. It's a few bucks. We can find out what's going on and we can intervene. In ways that are relatively inexpensive and the cure would be effective. together 
like this incubating together, you just contaminated the whole lot, right? So if you have small batches, small family, small batch farm, small family farms, that's a tongue twister for me. Uh, then you, you could probably source it. You know it'll, it'll be the best thing you can do if you can source it correctly. And that's true about all the food we eat. If you're the, if close to the source, you know the source, you know how it's produced, small batches, family farms, not industrial production, where everything gets contaminated and mixed together, it would probably be better. And I, that's why I love going to Europe. You know, if you go to France, you see all these small dairy farms. That's exactly the way it should be, but that's not the way it is here, obviously. Well, if you boil, so uh, so if you boil, it will kill. If you boil, it will kill the exosome. It's the exosome that you want. If you get so low heat pasteurization, I believe is in the low hundreds. Just be, just before you ask the answer any more questions, um, there is we're offering a discounted fit test here today as well and tomorrow. So it's normally three ninety five. It's going to down to $200, so again, what we found is it's a great way that you can do it now versus if we give, give you a kit, it will uh, sit on a dusty shelf in your offices, I'm sure you're all familiar with that, so there's an opportunity to get the test done here, we have a optimist here um, to kind of do the biggest picks and then get that test done, so we have a you are considering and bring it into practice to at least get the test done as well. So, sorry, I'm sure you're not too No, thank you for bringing that up. Yes, so Colossian is the first milk left down in milk. It's probably, probably very healthy. Um, but again, if it's batched, and you know, again, you have to know what the source is. Um, there's going to be immunoglobulins in there. Phenomenal. Um, if, if it's pasteurized by heat, uh, again, you can kill the egg any exosome in there. But if you get a fresh source, it's probably amazing. You can buy it in the store. Yeah, you can get you can get low heat pasteurization. Um, so that's what I buy. It's non homogenized, low heat. Minimally pasteurized. It's minimally. It's, 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 I, I think it's. Is it 140 degrees? Yeah, or less. Yeah. So 140 degrees or less. Really if you get above 140 degrees, and there's papers on this, so I'm not just making this up. If you if you if you go above a, a certain threshold. The, the, the exosome is just off. You lose a lot of the value. Um, anything else? You mentioned exosomes affecting the hypothalamus. You mentioned about exosomes affecting the hypothalamus. Do you advocate the use of IV exosomes? Do I advocate using which exosomes? IV exosomes, which are given purpose in the marketplace. Well, if Okay, so that, that's a, that thing for a little bit of discussion. So, IV exosomes in the United States is not legal. Um, uh, it, unless it's allogeneic, I'm sorry, unless it's autologous. So, if you get exosomes in your cell, that is okay to be in the United States. Um, but then, you really want to, I mean, will I go take my own exosome and give it back to me? No way. I'm 74 years old. Lots of toxic soup in there. So I would, I would prefer to be offshore and get exosomes offshore where it's legal. That's what I do. But that's just me. Um, in the United States, you can only use uh, what follows this exosome and you cannot use exosomes from anybody else. Unless it's part of the clock. So Dr. Drew is making very much a big difference over the wine right now. So thank you very much for being here.